It's a pleasure to be here at the International Roblox Developers Conference 2008. Uh, I'm Jeff Lay, I'm here to uh, give a presentation. It's, thank you for inviting me here to present. Um, it's a Despertization of Space and Time, Role in Roblox Design, a nice uh, pretentious title. And uh, let's first look at the history of discretization. I'm using this to talk about taking a continuous phenomenon and breaking it up into a finite series of parts. Um, we can see this in video displays. We started off uh, well, long before VGA, but I'm going to start with VGA, where you had, say, 320 by 200 resolution for an entire screen. And uh, then you worked up to Super VGA, and nowadays you get all the way up to WQXGA, which is just a ridiculous number of pixels. The question that we have to ask ourselves when we see this relentless march of progress is, does this binary discretization always be a good thing? Um, the hardware manufacturers will tell us that it is because they want to sell us the next generation. And another important point is you can always emulate the low resolution solutions on a high resolution display. You just double, triple, quadruple pixels. But the question that we should address is, is there any reason why you would choose to use a lower resolution than you have to? I'm going to look at this in uh, three different types of discretization I'm going to look at in detail and how they affect gameplay and why you might want to pick a course of discretization than you have to. Uh, the first is spatial division, then angular division, and then temporal division, dividing up time. The last one that I just added on here because I realized I didn't cover it is the idea of discretizing color, <coughs> namely going to either monochrome or something like 4-bit where you have a fixed palette. Uh, this is what Curses ends up making you suffer with, really, because you can't practically change the colors very easily. And there's a big difference between a fixed palette and being able to choose your palette. Because with a fixed palette, you have to use that bright magenta color, and it ends up looking like angry fruit salad very easily. <coughs> so with a free palette, you can you know, pick more same colors. Then you have 8-bit, like 256 color uh, engines, all the way to true color world. The first section is looking at dividing up space. I've built a simple hierarchy here, uh, from rooms to tiles to pixels to um, vector representations. The first example is rooms. When you divide up space into rooms, you don't um, lay a grid down and uniformly divide the space. You divide it up into regions based upon the semantic importance of those regions. And uh, examples of this are in interactive fiction, um, like adventure, um, also, multi-user dungeons usually use a room type presentation. And another interesting point is in Japanese role-playing games, often their battle sequences have a room-like division. And the idea of a semantic division is instead of breaking my apartment up into little squares where this square is my chair and this square is my couch, I break it up into gameplay relevant regions such as lying on the couch, sitting on the chair. And uh, in the case of a battle system, you break it up in the part of the battle that's important. You don't care exactly where the players are on the field. You care who's in front of who. So who takes the attacks from the enemy and who blocks the attacks from the people behind. And uh, the advantage of this system is you don't have to travel in, those in between areas. You can just immediately go um, to the place you care about without having to worry about how it's structured internally. One disadvantage is, is you lose the ability to have real emergent tactics. If there's some solution to the puzzle that requires you to be halfway between the chair and the couch, you can't express that because the designer doesn't have that space in the game. Well, it's in a more uniform division, that space will exist even if the designer didn't consciously want it to exist. So you might find a solution to the puzzle that the designer didn't think of. That brings us to the next level of discretization, which is tiles. Uh, and this is the one most familiar to roguelike designers, because that's what Rogue used and a lot of us use. Um, Dungeon Master also uses it, and it's an interesting example because it's a first-person game that uses a tile-type representation. And Ultima Online also uses it, which is I, I find interesting because it doesn't feel like it uses tiles when you sit in the game, because you, you, it's not really clear that you only stop at tile boundaries, you think there's just some overshoot, um, but it is completely tile-based. Um, the idea of tiles, it, I'm classifying as being uh, breaking up space uniformly in a grid representation with approximately one character per tile. The, uh, the, the, you might consider tiles to be a, uh, just a special case of rooms. 
I just have a whole bunch of rooms and I always connect them north, west, south and I have tiles. The big difference is you often see more than one room in your area, so more than one tile range of view. And uh, also because the designer has sort of guaranteed this regular connectivity, you can gain a sort of kinesthetic sense when you map a space. You can remember, oh, the lawn sort of left behind was up over there, or, uh, you know, I've walked all the way around this circle, I know that there's nothing in between because my walls connected to each other, something you can't really have in a room type world. And that goes on to the idea of distances and positions suddenly being coded and available to the player and relevant to the gameplay. And uh, this means block and informations become well defined. Instead of battle order being a matter of this person's in front of someone else, I have to actually put them in front of the other person and maneuver them to keep them in there. Or in the case of a game like Ultima Online, I could take four fighters and have them lined up across a corridor. And then no matter how many enemies come towards me, they can't get to the mages behind because there's the physically blocking of the fighters in between. And that's something easy to set up because you have this discrete tile representation to place each character and to know that you've filled up all the gaps. The next level of discretization is we say, okay, characters can move within a tile. So we basically have a pixel level, or like a very fine grid, where the grid is the size of the pixels on the screen. Um, infamously, Ultima 8 switched to this method. Um, Baldur's Gate, I think, also used this method. At least their backdrops were complete bitmaps. They didn't even use tiles for the background mm -hmm. engine. And uh, this allows for some advantages. You can have curved edges that work well. Uh, the staircase in King's Quest, actually four, not five, um, always frustrated me because you had to walk the character around this curved staircase without falling down to your death. Uh, you, you can do diagonal hallways properly because you don't get this staircase and artifact from the really coarse tile resolution. Um, you can also allow partial movement for the character so you don't have to move an entire tile every turn. And uh, the downside though is blocking becomes a lot more difficult to set up. It's not as clear if two people are close enough to block anyone from moving between them. And it's uh, not as clear if you're trying to get four people to move together forward one step, how you get them to move exactly one step forward if they have partial movement. So there's no well-defined idea of a single step. And the final problem is the reason why Ultima 8 was this, this infamous, namely, in that game you had these pentagrams and you had to place regents at the correct locations in the pentagrams and cast a spell. The trouble is it was a one or two pixel region you had to put those regents on and failure resulted in you know nothing happening or losing a regency and to try again. And uh, this was extraordinarily frustrating and wouldn't have occurred if they had had a coarser representation because the regents would have snapped onto the uh, candles properly. The next uh, type is a vector representation where instead of trying to fill your space with, with tiles or pixels of certain values, you just define borders of your space. And uh, Urban Warfare, I believe, used this technology and so, did, so does uh, most 3D games like EverQuest uh, where you just define polygons for your surface rather than um, voxels. And in this case, you've abandoned the Cartesian grid as a, as, a, as a fixed representation. And um, I'd like to point out that I don't consider this necessarily to be a finite discretization in the pixel level one, so much as it's just a totally different approach. Because when you zoom, when you zoom a vector representation down to one line segment being your full screen, it's just as meaningless to zoom farther as it is in a pixel one when you have one pixel filling your whole screen. So really, it's not infinitely zoomable. It still has a resolution, which is how finely you made those uh, polygons. It is, however, rotatable. You don't have a preferred direction. This is what I meant with the Cartesian grid going away. You probably still represent coordinates as x, y, z, or x, y doubles, but uh, the, you don't have to have one primary y axis and one primary x axis. You can hide that from the user entirely. The downside of that is you have an orientation problem. Namely, the user might forget which way is up and then have difficulty uh, navigating their land. And EverQuest, for example, needed a sense direction to recover from spinning in circles. And Descent actually needed a gameplay feature that you don't know which way is up anymore. And you, you, you have to really know how to navigate yourself. The other big trouble with uh, vector representation is the risk of leaks and holes. Um, because you, you don't have this, this fixed quantization, um, you could have small um, holes in your geometry from floating point error or artist error. And then your characters could fall through those holes to their death, and that's very annoying and embarrassing. 
So that covers how to divide up space. Next question is how to divide up the circle or angles when you're uh, when you're looking at uh, um, ways directions in which you're allowed to move and directions <coughs> in which you're allowed to fire weapons. The first one uh, is the simplest: only north, west, south, east. I think I have all of them there. Um, and that's used by powder. And uh, Dungeon Master also only lets you move in four primary directions. And uh, there's some big advantages, such as key assignment is very straightforward. You have the arrow keys, you don't have to worry about all these YUBN issues. Um, a disadvantage is the force multiplier. This is when you've taken your character foolishly into the center of a room of orcs. How many orcs get to hit you every turn? In a four-way attack world, only four orcs get to hit you every turn, so there's only four times cost to being really um, stupid with your planning. Um, the other interesting idea is to look at the shape of the metric that it imposes. If you take your app and look at all the tiles you can reach in, say, five, five steps, in the case of a four-way movement, you have the diamond shape um, of, of what sort of area you can reach. Uh, the other interesting point is you don't have to worry about corner cutting, because you can't cut corners. You don't have to spend cognitive resources wondering, should I cut the corner of this L-shaped corridor or just go around the long way? You always go around the long way. It makes walk algorithms a lot more straightforward. It doesn't explain why I still don't have a walk algorithm in powder even though it's more straightforward. That's a separate issue. Powder has an interesting exception where um, I did keep eight-way range combat. And so one unit of melee range only attacks four squares. Yet one unit of range range um, attacks eight squares. And this disparity basically allows ranged attacks to get one free attack compared to melee attacks. So a uh, one range range spell like the chill and touch spell uh, is useful even if you have a really powerful weapon. Because when an enemy is diagonally adjacent to you, you can use that spell. But you can't attack them with the weapons. So you might as well get the free spell in before you uh, um, attack with or move in. And this also means that if your enemies have ranged attacks, you do get an 8 times force multiplier if you're surrounded. Uh, the next idea is a hex-based game. We don't have many of those in the roguelike world. Hex Crawl, for example, does it. And uh, the hex grid representation gives you a 6 times force multiplier, a nice in-between number. And uh, one thing, though, I think most people with hex-based games use omnidirectional attack rules. I think the reason why is um, hex tiles really have the nice aesthetically pleasing lines for the off primary angle lines. Well, as both the four way and eight way connectivity for some reason always look jagged and, and unusual. The eight way is the you have a grid based representation and you also can attack along the, the, the corner directions. Um, if you have eight directions for movement, uh, if you look at the, character, the spaces you can get to with five steps, you end up with a square rather than the diamond because you can go along the uh, diagonal corners. You have an eight times force multiplier when not, and uh, corner cutting suddenly becomes an important choice. You hit an L-shaped cor corridor, you can save turns and, uh, and by cutting the corner. Even systems that penalize you with 1.4 times cost for doing diagonals, well, you still are better off taking the diagonal than taking two steps. You're also better off because not stepping on that corner square means you're not exposed to any traps in the corner square. And so it uh, often can become something you always have to be thinking of. NetHack is unusual in that it only allows you to attack in eight directions for ranged attacks. It doesn't have an omnidirectional ranged attack rule. And uh, I, I, I think this is actually a very powerful idea that's often discounted as being something done just for, you know, backwards compatibility with ancient hardware, but it, uh, it has some very interesting gameplay effects. First of all, every point of range, range you have in your range attack only gives you eight more squares of threat. You, you don't get the full perimeter of uh, opportunity to attack only along those eight primary rays. So adding a point of range to the enemies, to the player's uh, uh, weapons has a very fixed amount of benefit that it gives. It doesn't have a constantly increasing benefit. Um, the targeting interface is also dead simple because you don't have to worry about them trying to hit the wall beside a character or hit the character. They, they just specify their direction. And um, it also has a nice technique where escaping character, escaping creatures and players can actually dodge out of lines of fire. And dodge not in bullet time sense where the arrow's flying towards them so they step out of the way. 
but dodge in the uh, dodge and lasers type of sense. You can't dodge a laser beam because it moves as fast as you can see it, but you can dodge where the gun is pointing and thus effectively dodge the laser beam. And uh, that's what you can do in this case because any attack in the Black Dragon only has eight ways that it's, it's, it's pointing, you can keep out of its uh, threat range. The omnidirectional angular approach is what uh, Adon and the Bang Band use, where you can uh, do your range attacks on any line. And uh, they often then use a circular metric, so a range of five is a nice circular area that can be threatened. And the difference between that and the, the metric for walking in often is a source of concern, uh, concern because uh, attacking someone on a diagonal becomes even more advantageous. Um, but plus one range to the weapon gives you four times the current range tiles to attack. And so this is why range often becomes so coveted by the users because they know that they will always get even more, the more range you have, the more benefit there is to more range. There's also no target advance. So if you're a ranged player, as soon as you see the enemy, you start mashing the fire key. You don't have to do any positioning or thinking along the way. And uh, so that sort of becomes a, a downside to this because you lose some gameplay in that, that world. Um, the, it's very important in this case to make sure your line of fire and line of sight match because if I can see the enemy, I assume I can shoot it. And uh, that can be difficult when your line of sight is one of these nicely optimized algorithms and line of fire is just a present hand line. And it's also very hard to visualize friendly fire. A lot of games wisely give you the um, potential fire path charted out in the target. The trouble is, if, I, if I'm thinking before I hit the fire key, can I hit that orc? I can't tell until I try and target it what it's going to hit along the way. Whereas in the eight-way system, I can know before I even try and target, so I, 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 I don't have to spend as much time looking about with the UI. Um, the other approach at omnidirectional is to allow you to move in any direction, which is something that doesn't make much sense in a uh, tile-based game, but in a, uh, in a more pixel level or vector type approach, but the idea of being able to move any way you want. And uh, one concern is this might result in an unbounded force multiplier where people can surround you in every point of the circle and, and crush you that way, especially if there's no collision detection between creatures, as we can see in many 3D master multiplayer uh, games. Um, the Dungeons and Dragons 3rd edition, I believe, has some flanking rules that sort of have a semantic solution to that, where they say, given a sized enemy, how many people can surround it of a different size, and uh, so basically explicitly determine the force multiplier that way, rather than by trying to figure it out by actual positions on the grid. That covers angular separation. The next one is to look at dividing up time into different size pieces. The first is turns, which again we're the most familiar with. That's what Rogue, NetHack, and Angband all use. It comes down to the you move, I move um, system. And I, I, I make the claim that all speed systems, with their priority queues and all their complexity, are just a matter of choosing who is going to move next. So we have this sort of sequence of people who get to move, possibly duplicates in there before it gets back to your turn. And but that that's that's as the user the only thing that matters and the only thing you really see. The, the only exception to that is if you have timed effects like poison that sort of does bring this global timing. Otherwise it's just going around the table of who gets to go next. Uh, the big advantage of turn-based is of course the time to think. Uh, I, can, I can sit there, sit back, figure out what I'm doing, sober up, and then try, try again with a uh, clear thought. The big question you keep asking yourself in turn-based games is, will I live to see the next turn? Because really, as long as the answer is always yes, I'm going to win the game eventually. And uh, th this, this becomes important because you often want to optimize or have long actions. If I use the walk key to automatically walk down the corridor, I want to know what happens if I encounter an enemy um, and whether or not I'll ever get control back of my character. Similarly, if I go to put on some plate mail and that takes many turns, or many, a lot of time, I need to sort of know, will I ever get to see my command prompt again, or will it be, do you want to identify your possessions? And the last one is, comes into that whole sequence type idea, namely how predictable it is uh, to, if your enemy gets a double attack. Often an enemy being 10% faster is expressed by them getting an extra attack every 10 turns, but that doesn't, uh, 
but that doesn't help me if I'm if I can survive one more attack from the enemy, but not two. I need to know does does the enemy get that double attack this turn? If I can't figure that out, I always have to assume they get the double attack, which results in a more conservative gameplay. And the big trouble with turn-based is a multiplayer. Um, it requires other players to wait, and no doubt in any party, someone's going to take off to the fridge and leave everyone else frozen mid-step while they uh, try, try and figure out what they're going to drink next. Um, solutions to this have been proposed, such as surreal time, which I think uh, MA Bennett uses, and uh, which you only synchronize with when you're within a certain range of the enemies, I mean, of the other players. And then you can have time up based systems. Uh, one, one problem, uh, one point I'd like to just point out is even in totally real time uh, multiplayer games, you still have this waiting for other players problem. Anyone who's played in a group in one of these games, and you spend half your time trying to assemble the group uh, to get going, and then uh, people are like, out of mana, need more regions, you know. I should have got them before you got here. The next time based system is Heartbeats. Uh, this is very similar to turns, at least in my categorization. Ultima 3 used this sort of system, where you have turns, but there's a maximum time for each turn before it just automatically says you do nothing. And so this creates, this allows you to go as fast as you want through, through, through simple areas, but uh, prevents you from stopping forever thinking in hard areas. Um, the trouble is, of course, this will be subverted. Uh, I found in Ultima 3, if I started to cast a spell and then I didn't say which spell to cast, I could wait forever on that prompt, and then just cancel the prompt when I was ready to go on with my actions. Uh, and a lot of stuff can run under emulators nowadays. When you're inside an emulator, they can freeze time, they can rewind time, they can save your game state. There's no real control you have over that anymore. The next example is uh, similar to turns, except instead of making only a single turn each, single move each turn, you assign a certain number of movement points for your turn. And uh, Layer of the Demon Inc. uses this. Um, Warlords is a, uh, is a strategy game that uses this sort of approach. And uh, the playback of the actions could be one at a time or queued, but, uh, but it basically allows you to mix long and short actions in a way that's very clear to the user. You know, okay, I've got five movement points to put on this plate mail, then I can move this far to retreat, or, you know, I, as opposed to the turn-based system, which you often don't know how many turns I lose by putting that plate mail on. And also the whole charge and attack issue gets very clear to the user often. Like, you get this in, uh, in uh, pen and pencil role-playing games where you want to attack the enemy right now on your turn, but you know, it might be you know, one centimeter away from them. Do I have to spend a turn going one centimeter close? So they often have this whole idea, oh, you can run a certain distance and still attack. And that's where movement points can, uh, can address. Um, so the next example I don't know of any examples of in, uh, in sort of roguelike type areas, probably because it doesn't work very well, is simultaneous turn, <coughs> where everyone makes their turn at once, not seeing what the other people are doing, and then they all resolve simultaneously. Uh, Scorched Earth did this, uh, it's a 3D tank game, not 3D, 2D tank game, and uh, you, you had a simultaneous mode where everyone could choose their fire areas and all the bolts would shoot at once. And uh, it nicely, uh, it does imply everyone's turn has to be the same length, but it uh, does minimize that sort of artificial precedence that turns put in, of, you know, everyone gets to see another command prompt at the same time, so I don't get the feeling that, you know, it's sort of in their hands until it gets back to me. Um, whether or not it gets back to me is a result of my decisions this turn only. The trouble with uh, grid-based roguelike games is you might end up with air dancing where you're chasing someone and always attacking where they used to be and they're always stepping out of the way. And so that would be what has to be solved for this to work there. Uh, the last area is the real-time area where you don't discretize. So you discretize at such a fine scale that it might as well be real-time. Um, some Diablo 2 players think of frames or something like that as their unit of time. But to me it might as well be continuous. Um, Ultima Online is also, uh, of course, real-time along with EverQuest. And so time just keeps moving at a fixed rate for all players. It makes running long distances tedious. And uh, to trouble is battles become a more of a matter of training ahead of time, what things to do in what order, uh, rather than trying to figure out your tactics while you're actually fighting. And uh, you also don't have any time to inspect your inventory uh, while actually adventuring. You know, have to go back to town to figure out all your gambling. 
And, but it, the big advantage, of course, it simplifies multiplayer. You can actually do that in a very straightforward way. And uh, so that covers my overview. And uh, basically, with today's technology, we can do the fine systems. We aren't restricted to very low resolution or very turn-based systems. Um, and so, because one reason for turn-based is, of course, you can't run real time because your system's not fast enough. Um, but uh, I, I hope I showed that there are gameplay changes that occur when you move to finer levels of discretization. And thus, there might be a game design choice to use the coarser level discretization. And there's a code that I don't know the origin of, and uh, maybe someone does. This isn't the right co code either. Which is, when the communication channel becomes instant, the way you use it changes entirely. And uh, that applies IRC, no, it's a message versus uh, email, it's probably the best example, where they're both text-based, person-to-person communication, but the way you treat instant message is very different from the way you treat email, precisely because it gets there instantly. And uh, I didn't address the other reasons to use core systems. There's the aesthetic reason, namely you like the look of pixel graphics or a tile-based grid, and uh, there's also obviously the workload reason. While it could be argued that it's very hard to color very few pixels well, um, it's certainly uh, easier to color a few pixels poorly than it is to color lots of pixels poorly. And the uh, same occurs for frames to animate. If you have just turn based, you might not need as much animation. And that concludes my presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mention one uh, way of discretization of space that's between the tiles and the pixel based discretization. It's the uh, aberration of tile movement where you have multi tile creatures. Uh, <coughs> well, you usually, in, in pixel based uh, discretization, your character is usually more than one pack pixel uh, large. So the natural way is uh, to have, the, uh, for example, you can't go through one pixel uh, hole mm -hmm. on that. Uh, so the, the first step uh, from tiles to, to pixels is to emulate that with multi multi tile creatures. This introduces, of course, its whole range of problems. So some of the pixel pro, uh, pixel discretization problems come from this. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Namely, when I was talking about formations and you know, the leap through a formation, you. you one pixel doesn't fit your character if you have a large, many pixel character, right? Because you, your collision detection you do it with a larger size. The trouble is, as a min max in game player, I want my characters to be as far apart as they can and still block that area. And so if I make it one pixel smaller, it blocks, and one pixel larger, the enemy gets through. And how can I know when I'm at that spacing, the optimal spacing? And so I have to conservatively be tighter than I need to be. Um, I was just wondering, um, there are, yeah, like you said, um, in eight directional movement, often it's the same cost for moving diagonally as moving straight forward. Uh, but um, I think in most cases the field of view is still a circle. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of any games where the field of view is an actual rectangle? Uh, well. Powder has the four-way movement, yet uses a rectangle for the field of view. Yeah. So it does the complete opposite problem of you okay. can see farther on the diagonals than you can move. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there I set the field of view to the size of the screen, so you don't really notice that yeah. effect. Um, I don't know of anyone that, does anyone know of anyone that uses the square? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, Cryptover, my game, uses it. Um, the reason, at first I used, um, at first I did use the circle field of view because aesthetically it looks much nicer yeah. and I very quickly started getting you want to come in? <laughs> I, I very quickly started to get, get complaints from players that you cannot see the edges of the screen and that uh, having a circular uh, field of view is um, is annoying because you, you have to walk much further to see the, the edge of the room if you have a rectangular room, 
and uh, I changed it then to a rectangular uh, field of view. And actually, um, I can imagine in games where you have uh, a lot of open spaces, for instance, a lot of Angband does have uh, wide open spaces, uh, the levels are quite large, and uh, we don't want to put it anyway. <laughs> Uh, the levels are quite large, and then you can actually see this square, and it looks it looks kind of artificial and not that nice. But in games, uh, which are quite um, what do you say, the level is quite small, and everything is, is tight, and and you don't really see very far anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, aesthetically, it's not really a problem because because your field of view is going to get blocked in the middle anyway, and, and it doesn't look doesn't look that artificial. Yeah, that's what I have with powder. You don't you don't see it usually unless you use the look command. And yeah. Even then, usually there's a wall in the way, so yeah. it's not clear. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that uh, even rectangular field of view looks better if you run the corner. So you just remove one tile from each corner and it already looks better. Yeah. <laughs> Diagonal movement with the, to move uh, one diagonal square is uh, a little bit longer than uh, around moving uh, straight into one direction, and I don't know, this give, doesn't give a lot of problems with um, time synchronizations, or should there be a penalty to move diagonally? I think in two dimensions it's just square root of two. If you go to 3D, square root of 3, uh, in 4 it depends which way in 3D, because all of a sudden yeah. you have going diagonal on the edge, which yeah. is square root of 2, diagonal on the, the corner, or, you know, so it's... Or, uh, in, in my uh, theoretical rope slides, if you go 4D dimensional, the, the general diagonal uh, has the length 2, and <laughs> this gives, I don't, I don't know, diagonal movements, uh, gives some problems to uh, how fast creatures should move. Uh, yeah, that, that's my argument with that is to is to claim that we're defining our own metric anyways, so we don't need to use the Euclidean metric, and that way we can say diagonals are one, which uh, gives you that square-shaped distance metric rather than circular metric, and then of course get the field of view problems. But at least it's more straightforward to the user. My big trouble with the 1.4 cost for diagonal movement is is then if I escape diagonally I might get a double attack from someone or I might not you know it gets into that whole world that confuses me as a player. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that um, to simplify gameplay and in a way also to make the gameplay more consistent is more important than to make sure that it's uh, realistic because the game is not realistic anyway. It's not really the, the main point. Have you noticed any one uh, thing about pixel-based discretization? The games that are pixel-based uh, almost never have a field of view because you have a problem with creatures at the edge of uh, the field of view. Should you show them whole, or should you hide them, or should you only show a part of them? Uh, some games uh, use it and just dim the the. Right. But uh, well, I never saw a game that would uh, show you the innards of, of the creature because it's at the <laughs> edge of the field of view. Um, I think, actually, I think there might be an exception to that. Um, what is it? Labyrinth Rogue? The, there's, oh, I forget the name. It's, uh, I think, Labyrinth. But it's, it, it's, they, they use a perfectly circular field of view that's almost a cutout stamp. And so you do see only parts of the creatures that you run into. And so you've got like a, uh, you know, that spotlight window of what you can see that moves around. So that cuts off people exactly on that. But then that's not a line of sight blocking field of view. That's just a circular one. Um, back to the penalty for moving diagonals. The pixel discussion reminded me. I think it was Doom that had um, people started doing strafe running because if you strafed and ran forward, it basically just added the two vectors so you'd move faster uh, because you're basically moving along the diagonal. So they'd use that to get places faster than they would by just running forward. And uh, so 
in the pixel based games you might want to really worry about diagonals to make sure moving one pixel diagonally costs more than one pixel vertically or people will find they can get places faster on a diagonal than vertically. It's really when you work with a tile based game where it starts getting um, more quantized. Yeah. I think Gauntlet, Gauntlet for the NES had slower diagonal movement. It's pretty 